All right, so thank you, Albert. Uh, over to you. Okay, I think I think I think I, uh, there was there's a bit of confusion, and uh, even some of my colleagues have uh, are still struggling to join. Um, from from the link that I think was shared by Zippo. Uh, so do we have everybody uh, now? I do see uh, Stephanie is there, and so is uh, Johannes, who has his hand up. Please go ahead. He, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Can you confirm if Dr. Saurabh is, is also in? Uh, I can't see him. I texted him, but I'm not sure I if am... he's, he's one of the panelists. I am checking. No, I do not see him on the list. Okay. Okay, uh, so let, let me check uh, again, sorry. Um, Stephanie, can you confirm if you are in? Because you are. she's saying she's still in the waiting list. Hello? Honore, she... can you confirm if Stephanie is in? Yes, Stephanie Winnett is in, uh, is in the room. Okay. Yeah. Stephanie, can you confirm? She does have she does have a hand up. Uh, I don't know if she can ah, okay. So so it means she's confirming or okay. I, I would I would assume so. Um it would be preferable, Stephanie, if you could uh, just uh plug in oh. your uh, audio and uh, talk yeah. to us. I think she needs to be assigned um, to be a speaker because currently she's not a participant. And I think in this meeting, participants um, can only listen and engage through the Q&A. So Linda, can you please assign her to be a panelist as well? Zippo, you're right, actually. I've actually experienced similar things. Um, I joined now as a panelist. That's why um, I'm having even a video call. Yeah. So mm. if Linda can please assist us to change Stephanie Winnett um, to be a panelist. And already, who is the second speaker again? So that when he joins, Linda can also change their settings to be a panelist. Sarah Sinha. Ah, and okay. also, uh, yeah, and also we have uh, right. Edest Getahun, who was uh, to make um, an opening remark. She says she cannot jo uh, have access. Uh, please repeat, who is it? Kidest uh, Kidest Getahun. Um, I don't see. Uh, um, she says cannot have access. I can't access. I do this. see her in the chat. Uh, I am on it. I can allow people to speak here, so I, I can... think yeah, just allow everybody so that uh, uh, so that we we resolve this. Hi, Albert. Can Hello. Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. All right. <laughs> but, okay. All right. Um, but I uh, you won't be able to access the video or uh, mute. Oh, I can mute and mute myself. So I think yes, that's yes, good. That's, that's, that's good enough. We, thanks. Yeah, that's what we have decided to do. So, um, right, so thanks. We, colleagues, we, we still don't have Dr. Saurab with us, but I think we can just proceed. Uh, if he joins, I'm trying to um, text him to find if he can... Uh, we can't respond, or maybe if he has any challenges, he has not responded. 
Okay. Um, sorry about this, colleagues. Um, yes, so thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we just promoted and gave rights to both Stephanie and uh, Kinnet, right? Is she, she in? So she will be able to, to also put on her video. Okay. Perfect. And then um, as uh, the doctor, the good doctor joins, um, I will also assign him um, all of the privileges. So I think um, that being said, Albert, um, I think we are good to go on our end. And um, yeah, over to you. Great. I think we can start. Yeah. Please, we can start. Jonas. Perfect. I can see a good amount of uh, individuals joining us as well. Okay. Um, all right, welcome once again, everyone. I would say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, depending on from where you are joining us. And welcome to our regional webinar on skills partnership for um, labor migration in Africa. My name is Jonas. Um, I am uh, working at the Better Regional Migration Management Program or the BRMM program of the International Labor Organization and I will be your host uh, and moderator for today. This webinar is a collective effort between ILO, GIZ, and the AUDA NEPAD, aiming to um, strengthen dialogue and collaboration to address um, the skills mismatch within Africa, aligning with the objective of the African continental free trade area and the global compact for migration. Um, in terms of acknowledgement, we are um, honored to have with us today um, key stakeholders from various um, sectors, including um, a representative from the African Union, the, the International Labour Organization, the German government, and other key stakeholders relevant or from relevant organizations. Uh, special thanks to our panelists who would be sharing their insights on how we can better align um, labor migration with market demand, uh, reduce brain drain, and enhance skills mobility within the continent. Um, so in terms of housekeeping rule, before we um, dive into our discussion, just a few housekeeping notes to, 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 to give. This webinar is being recorded and all participants will be um, muted during the panel discussions. Um, however, we encourage you Actually, we highly encourage you to, to utilize the Q&A feature um, on, for any questions or comments during the interactive sessions. Um, I would be quickly going through the brief yet exciting and exhilarating agenda we have. So the first one, um, um, we're going to have a welcoming remark by Gades Ketahun, the officer in charge of the BRMM project. And then we'd be having a guiding panel discussion that would be led by um, Alberto Cal, the skills development specialist within the, from the ILO. Um, and then we'll be having an interactive session, participant, uh, uh, participants with, of course, the, the panelists. In this session, I think I encourage once again for the participants to um, insert their questions here. And way, when they ask their questions, I would like to indicate uh, for them to indicate to whom that they, they wanted to address so that we do, given that we do have three uh, panelists and last, last but not least, we would be having a conclusion and then closure as well. Um, so this is pretty much is with the brief agenda and then we are exciting to continue. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce uh, Ms. Desketahun, uh, once again, the OIC BRM project to deliver an opening remark. Um, just over to you. Thank you so much, Yoni, uh, and apologies. Uh, my computer is acting up a bit. Uh, hope I'm audible. Yeah, you are, you are, you are audible and you are visible. We can see you very All well. All right. 
All right, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you again, um, uh, Yoni, for this uh, good introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, attendance today. Uh, I'm delivering my uh, keynote speech uh, on behalf of uh, our country director, Mr. Kumbula uh, Ndaba. And I'd like to really extend my warm welcome uh, to you all uh, to this uh, third regional webinar. Uh, which is aimed at promoting uh, an understanding of skills development dimension of labor migration. Uh, once again, I'd like really to um, appreciate your attendance today, uh, taking into account that some of you have uh, been requested to join uh, and uh, were invited within the short notice. Um, so on behalf of the ILO, our partner GIZ and Dada Nepad, we really appreciate your continued support and collaboration. So this webinar is an extension of our previous two webinars that were organized in December and April, um, December last year and April this time, uh, on the same topic. Uh, so our main objective is positioning skills development at the center of right-based and demand-led regular labor migration governance within the continent. Uh, this uh, webinar is, uh, all, is also informed by the growing demand of our destination countries, of different destination countries and countries of origin for a mutually beneficial skills labor migration uh, to counter negative impacts, including brain drain and underutilization of migrant worker skills, but also uh, brain waste. Um, during this uh, panel discussion through our panel of experts, uh, the objective is uh, for us to uh, see what are the current research and trends uh, say about skilled labor migration in the continent. Um, we'll be able to see some of the evolving policy dynamics in some destination countries like Germany. Uh, we'll be able to understand uh, the of, uh, private sectors, and also we'll be able to see some of the opportunities that Africa can benefit through skills partnership uh, in order to fill this labor short, uh, shortage uh, within and beyond the continent. I really hope uh, that this discussion will be informative and I would really encourage you guys to use the Q&A um, option and uh, engage, share, ask, and contribute uh, to this discussion. That is the major outcome of our webinar. Uh, with this, I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, hand over to Yoni. Thank you so very much, Kitty, for that um, brief yet extensive um, welcoming remark. Thank you once more. Now, um, in the interest of time, we'll begin with our we we okay so i didn't okay now i opened my video so now we'll be um going with our guiding um panel guided panel discussion so uh, where our panelists will explore um various themes related to skills partnerships and labor migration um and so to moderate this session i will be calling upon my other colleague Mr. Albert Okal uh, from Skills Development. Uh, he is a Skills Development Specialist within the ILO as well. So, Albert, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, well, welcome to all participants. Um, so, um, as Jonas has indicated, my role will be to um, uh, guide uh, panel discussions. And uh, first, I want to start by introducing um, uh, our panelists um uh, that have um, gladly agreed to contribute and share their experience and knowledge on this particular topic um i i would like to introduce uh, or first to confirm if dr dr sina has managed to join us uh, dr sina if you've managed to join can you let us know okay uh it seems dr sina is um is having some problems. Yes, but uh, we had invited uh, Dr. Saurabh Sina, who is uh, the Chief of Social Policy, Gender, Poverty and Social uh, Policy Division in the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Dr. Sina has um, a wealth of experience and has researched and documented and published um, uh, uh, severally on the topic of uh, uh, labor migration in the continent, particularly also focusing 
on um, the brain brain dimension of uh, the labor migration. And um, I hope that he will still join us. Uh, uh, and once he does, we will let you know and we'll also have his intervention on that. Our second panelist um, is Mr. John um, from, from GIZ. Uh, Mr. John is um, the head of labor migration and skills partnership in GIZ. Um, he has a wealth of experience working in, in Africa and also in numerous GIZ uh, programs that are linked to uh, promoting and facilitating skills partnership. Uh, he will be bringing um, in experience uh, from the German side and sharing with us the current uh, policy dynamics and programs that German is um, uh, undertaking to facilitate skilled labor migration into Germany. And then the third panelist um, is um, Stefania Winnett. Uh, Stefania is um, uh, coming from the International um, Organization of Employers. Uh, this is the, the global voice of all employers in the world. Um, and she is the head of stakeholders engagement. Um, and IOE has been um, engaging employers across uh, the globe to facilitate right-based, skills-based, demand-led uh, labor migration. She will be providing us with the employer's perspective and particularly also focusing on what uh, IOE or how IOE has been um, supporting uh, employers in the continent to facilitate skills labor migration. So uh, that is the, the uh, panel that we have. Um, uh, and and uh, the panel that will take us through uh, uh, the various questions. So uh, without uh, further ado, um, I want to start with uh, uh, Jean uh, Gruber. Um, oh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Sina. <laughs> Finally, uh, so uh, in fact, I had uh, arranged that Dr. Sina, we start with you. I, I don't know, can you, I, are you comfortable to start? Uh, yes. I just introduced you in, in your absence. I, I, I heard that. No, thank you, Charles. I heard that. Um, but uh, can can I come in a bit later, Albert? Uh, okay. That's okay. okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Because you just you just set in. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, we are very glad thank to have you. you. Yeah. Okay. So um, let, let me start um, um, our session um, by uh, asking um, uh, Mr. John and Mr. John, you can further introduce yourself if there's I've missed out some of the information so that at least our audience can understand your background, what you've worked in. But we wanted to get um, uh, your, your, your interventions and perspective regarding um, skills partnership and labor migration. Uh, particularly uh, given your background and experience in working in German-led um, uh, programs. Uh, we understand that uh, Germany, like many other European countries and other countries in other regions, are experiencing uh, labor shortages. And uh, uh, due to that, uh, uh, Germany has been um, instrumental in establishing uh, legislations and policy frameworks to ensure that it attracts skilled labor from other regions. And of recently, we've seen those efforts extended to sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 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 engaging African countries and economies uh, uh, to make sure that they get uh, workers, uh, uh, you know, to, to fill in these shortages in these particular uh, work areas. Uh, can you tell us um, uh, the, the, the current policy, uh, labor migration policy dynamics uh, that are happening and, and also share with us the various programs that uh, Germany has been undertaking in this particular regard. Thank you very much, Albert, for this warm welcome and um, thank you very much for um, all the participants to um, to be part of this uh, webinar. It's a big pleasure and honor to bring in some experiences. Uh, yes, I work in around 20 years in the field of skills development and migration and uh, and had also the chance to work in a in the skills development program in Ethiopia so I'm I'm very dedicated to the topic since uh, various years and 
as what I what I observe and what perhaps I can bring in here is of course the the latest dynamics perhaps and perhaps some experiences based on programs we also conduct in in different contexts. But but let me start. Overall, of course, we have a demographic transition all over the world. We have some markets. Uh, for example, also in Africa, where we have a lot of youth entering the labor market. And the question is, can the labor market accept um, those youth? And is the skill set up um, um, based on the on the demand? And, and on the other hand, we have markets where really the, the population is shrinking. And there, of course, Germany is getting older and older. And um, the question is how to manage this transition Overall, it's a global question, I think, arising, and I think the high noon is coming closer and closer. And and um, if you see the, the policy um, developments in Germany in the last years, of course, uh, there was always a quite liberal legislation, but of course, the legislation is the one thing. And on the other hand, of course, how to handle those and, of course, to find a good balance between, on the one hand, um, attractiveness and on the other hand of course a, a good regulation that the requirements are set up and of course that um, also networks can develop accordingly and that is not um, in a way uh, getting to a collapse because all the system cannot um, um, manage it and uh, I think this is, uh, is exactly if you have an, a look on the, uh, the latest reforms of last year where on the one hand I think we stick to the overall idea um, of qualification matters. It's one of the key pillars. Now we have the, the blue card, the EU blue card, where you um, especially um, highlight the, the a certain requirement in terms of the, the background and of course that we have salary thresholds. I think everything, by the way, everything is very well documented and also in detail uh, we found in the make it in germany website perhaps after the the, the webinar we can share this uh, web link because there also in english and in, in different um, languages you can get um, the detailed and very practical information on the other hand um, we there are also um, new opportunities if you see also the experience pillar and this experience pillar is um, uh, on the one hand, um, focusing um, state recognized qualifications who could be would, which could be um, recognized for um, an entry to Germany. On the other hand, also uh, two years um, of um, work uh, qualified work experience. This is this is quite new. Always connected that you are uh, have a concrete that you have a concrete job offer, and of course, uh, on the other hand, the financial means to sustain um, your living in Germany. But these um, uh, these new approaches also have uh, two um, new procedures um, hand in hand with this uh, dynamics. We have the Central Office of Foreign Education, which proves the backgrounds, uh, which sees, OK, this is an education we can we can count on. And on the other hand, also, what is a qualified um, work experience that this is also proved. On the other hand, of course, we have the Federal Employment Agency, if you take that's the, uh, the, the organization who is uh, carrying the labor market in Germany, who always checks, uh, not always, but in the in the certain cases, checks also the conditions of work, that we don't have, uh, that we have decent work uh, um, um, conditions, and of course that we have the same conditions for every citizen and also newcomer starting in Germany, that we don't have different markets there. Very important. And on the other hand, of course, we have um, the potential pillar. This is the, the, the reason and the very new one, and I think this leads us very well also to the discussion of uh, skills partnerships, um, which is a connection between a point system on the one hand, where this kind of uh, backgrounds like language and, and of course education matters. On the other hand, um, we have uh, the opportunity that you uh, can enter um, Germany also without a concrete um, uh, contract but you have to um, to show that you have the financial means to sustain this is the one opportunity or you have the commitment uh, declaration of commitment of somebody who is who is really granting your your living costs and the third uh, um, version which is really interesting in terms of uh, 
the vocational training uh, setup. If you take the vocational training um, in Germany, you have normally a contract with an employer and you earn some money. And um, therefore, you have also the opportunity that these earnings can be the grant for your financial, for your, for the, uh, that you offer the financial means to sustain during the education phase. Um, and this is an opportunity, of course, but you need, again, a working contract with an employer. And of course, the right uh, salary uh, thresholds are here also important. But I think it's something what, uh, in terms of building up a, a sustainable infrastructure for legal and, uh, and regular migration, is a very good opportunity, which perhaps can be developed um, uh, step by step. But I think to these models, we, we come later. And what is perhaps just in, in interesting to mention, too, that we have a, a new a ministerial position in our government, which um, negotiates um, bilateral migration uh, agreements. It's the special envoy of um, uh, migration partnerships or mig migration agreements. And this, uh, this position is quite new. And we are currently negotiating, for example, with several countries uh, partnerships, but they are much broader. They are not focusing only on labor migration. They are also taking other migration schemes into account. But I think these are measures uh, to establish a, a long-term um, infrastructure for fair and, and regular migration. As we see, uh, there is something to manage in the future and not only in the future, even by now. Perhaps I would stop here, this just a brief overview how um, some dynamics can be relevant now that we can move forward. And I would love to come into detail to think about the, the real global skills partnerships models. Thank you. John, for that. And, and I, I won't let you go first, but I wanted to ask you a yeah, follow-up question uh, uh, regarding, uh, I understand that uh, Germany through, um, I think BMZ or GIZ has implemented a number of skills partnership program in various regions, including some uh, in Africa. And, and some of them have been very successful. I'm, I'm aware of the triple win program, especially in the health sector. Um, uh, I, I could could you could you share with our audience, with our participants, the success? What what are the success factors for a skills partnership uh, between, for example, um, uh, an African country and 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 a Western country? Uh, and what are the elements? What goes into the into the partnership, particularly the ones that regards to uh, skills development and qualification? Because one of the issues that is coming up is that. The qualification standards, the education and training standards in Germany are very high, and that might be a stumbling block for most graduates uh, at different levels from Africa to access, you know, German labor market. Uh, at, at, I, I, again, I said at all uh, education levels. So, so if you can share with uh, with audience, uh, what are the what are the success factors? What is it that African countries, which are aiming at Germany and other Western countries, as a potential? Uh, labor migration, you know, destination countries. What should they put into in, into consideration, particularly in their training? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Of course, that's the one of the key points. Um, how to to start uh, the thinking? I would say, um, let's start with the the overall mover of migration that we have a demand side which is capable and and ready to invest into uh, education. And I think Stephanie Winnett, who is with us, uh, I can can explore more here. That of course uh, we have to have a demand, and the demand is also the the guiding um, <laughs> moving energy energy, how um, the requirements are uh, for somebody to start in the labor market. So that means on the one hand, um, is, uh, for example, language skills, are they uh, relevant? Um, uh, I think in most contexts, they are relevant, of course. And on the other hand, um, the question is, um, what is the uh, education base of, in the country of origin. How different are the systems? How different are the backgrounds? And how different also are the working conditions? Because uh, this always counts into the question how we can uh, prepare the adaptation training or uh, different uh, opportunities. We, we, in a way, um, differentiate between three models. 
taking somebody who has already a, a complete education and some work experience and goes for an adaptation training. That's perhaps model one. And the model two is that somebody is prepared for an education, a traineeship abroad, for example, for a vocational training in, in, in Germany, take it that way. And the third model, which I think is the most sustainable, is that we, that we develop hand in hand um, a, a system and invest into skills to follow the two tracks, the track into the local market, in the national market. Can we perhaps work hand in hand, with, like in some TVET projects, um, like we do it already to see how can we go for demand driven education there. But on the other hand, already implement language skills and additional skills that somebody could also uh, enter into uh, the, the foreign market. And that's really um, the, the model what we um, implemented, completely implemented in the health context, taking, for example, a partnership, and there we have also a bilateral agreement between the Philippines and, and Germany. Um, and we, we, of course, dedicate in the health sector always to the WHO code. That's why we have to be very careful how to develop those systems in different markets. Uh, if you take that market, there we even saw that the difference between the systems is not that far so it's even possible that you develop some, first you have to analyze the curriculum, then you see the differences and you can work on certain um, um, uh, training elements which could fit into the cu curriculum on the one hand. And what I think is always key that we work uh, hand in hand on uh, training of trainers and that we have, of course, a skills development plan, how we can really make a sustainable system integration, which is in line with the, with the national system on the one hand, and on the other hand, offers the pathway to a foreign country, in this case, Germany. And in, in this case, the Filipino case, we, we had also the opportunity that they get the direct recognition. So they get a formal exam in the Philippines, they get the stamp full recognition of their exam in, in the Philippines, and they have the opportunity to enter into the German market and they get, after completing the language, also immediately the stamp that, the, the, that their education is recognized if they followed the agreed curriculum, what we discussed. This is, I think, it, in a way, a dream comes true. If we if we get to more technical professions, the differences are normally completely different. So if you so we started recently a project in the global skills partnership model in um, Ghana and Senegal. For us, uh, it's also the first sub-Saharan um, global skills partnership model because, as you said, we already have um, many um, also BMZ. Uh, financed in EU finance uh, projects like the TAM project, perhaps well known, which uh, is really um, working uh, hand in hand with the North African countries, with Egypt, with um, Morocco and with Tunisia. And we have um, other um, projects also in the context of Latin America and Asia. And this is for us in, in Jordan, we also cooperate, which is not that far, but of course, in the, the sub-Saharan context, we are um, starting and and I think what we see now is really that a good analysis of the curricula and the the, uh, the employment um, environment is very key to understand how can we provide the the training um, according to um, the needs of the country of destination and on the other hand that we always have uh, this hand in hand approach what kind of training elements and perhaps even cost sharing systems are applying very well to the context. And uh, just let me um, close here. What is, of course, always key that we have this triple win idea in mind, that the overall um, action um, is benefiting the local system, the country of origin system, and uh, of course, the need of the migrant, that it's fair, that the cost sharing is transparent. Of course, I think everybody has to invest, but that it's transparent what to invest and what to get and where are the risks. And the same for the employer side in Germany, if, for example, if you take the country of destination, that an employer knows about the education backgrounds, knows about the risks, knows about the costs. And um, then I think step by step, 
um, these pilot projects help us to to in a way be the trailblazer to open the the, the pathway to build up trust to build up collaboration that um, companies and education educa um, institutions can work together and develop step by step um, an infrastructure but because we have to be aware it's not that we talk about 1000 by a pilot project i think we talk about 20 100 250 that we build up good connections and then build on the trust i think then of course the scaling up is possible but i the experience is that um, that of course if many activities uh, run uh, at the same time with the same approach then of course we can scale very good but that it's good that we have schemes which are agreed and that it's clear um, what is the investment by the migrant what what is the the standard what for example a tibet college offers in the country of origin there are language trainings integrated there are perhaps already additional curricula elements and if you take uh, the different Differences, for example, in the German context, of course, practical experience is key in the vocational training set up in Germany, and that it's a financing structure where companies come in uh, too. I think these are elements which um, can really help to to even give impulses and and inspiration for the national system, the TVET systems, where um, the private sector is, of course, one of the key drivers. That's why we always would recommend also to integrate the private sector into the, those um, uh, skills partnership um, programs that the curricular developments are really hand in hand with the uh, demand on the of the foreign market and the national market that we don't lose that um, that big um, goal to have a coherent system so perhaps this has a, a lot of input sorry for was a big package thank you <laughs> some of oh, the the yeah you are, you are highlighting some of the critical elements uh, uh, such as cost sharing uh, between uh, countries of destination and, and countries of origin in investing in training, uh, you know, looking critically looking into education curricula to make sure that there's harmonized uh, training standards um, and, and also integrating language, which is very, very critical if you want to access um, a, a foreign labor market. Um, and also uh, the critical engagement of, uh, of, of the, the private sector. And that's, that brings me to um, our, our second panelist, uh, Stephanie. Uh, you've heard uh, very well from, from John. Um, he emphasized over and over again the, the need for skills partnership to address the demand. Um, and, and by demand, we are meaning the, the, what is it that the private sector, the, the employers themselves are expecting from uh, uh, workers. Um, uh, and, and, and I understand, as I indicated, that IOE has been uh, instrumental and at the forefront in advocating for uh, private sector engagement in skills development partnership. Um, uh, we, we understand within the continent that various reports indicate, uh, for example, that the private sector is complaining that there's a huge mismatch uh, of uh, between what they, what they are looking for in, from the graduates or from workers and what is actually being made available. What role um, uh, can can you say that IOE has been playing in facilitating uh, uh, skills partnership mobility? Uh, you can start generally globally, but also can narrow down uh, our interests in the region uh, specifically. Uh, uh, so, if you can give us some some of the you know examples that uh, IOE has, has has taken in terms of steps to rally or mobilize employers to be part and parcel of the skills mobility partnership program. Yeah, welcome. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Albert, and thank you for the invitation. Um, and I think I'm going to pick up a few points that uh, Mr. Herbert uh, mentioned, and thank you for including the private sector in this conversation. Uh, maybe, can I just start maybe by introducing the IOE, not um, the audience yes, may not please. be aware of yes, who please. the International Organization of Employer is. Um, we have a footprint in more than 140 countries. And the members are the national employers organizations um, in the 150 countries, um, uh, as well as uh, partner companies. And we have 30, uh, we have members in 36 countries um, in Africa. 
So I'll be talking globally, but I'm I'm also going to focus a little bit on the African continent and on the continent, not only as um, as uh, a continent sending uh, uh, skills abroad, but as as a continent receiving also skills, because from the employer's viewpoint, we're always on the receiving side. You'll always have employers uh, based wherever in the world looking for new talent. So at IOE, we advocate for business interests globally, engaging with governments as much as we can really to try to influence uh, policy change. And um, in terms of um, migration, we've um, published a number of publications uh, on the topic that we present every year at the Global Forum on Migration and Development which was led by the government of France, and now they have handed it over to Colombia. Uh, in Africa, we, um, and, and globally also, we, we uh, contribute to the Global Compact for Migration, and we were very active in um, the negotiations on Objective 5 on regular pathways, Objective 6 on responsible recruitment, and Objective uh, 18 on skills development, which are really important for us. Uh, in Africa, we have uh, mainly worked on um, two, two main documents. One is a guide for employers in Africa to help them um, uh, advocate. So it's an advocacy tool for them. And then out of that, we also had a declaration from the African employers that we presented at the last uh, Global Compact for Migration Review. And we consulted our um, employers in Africa. So today I'm, I'm trying to speak on, on that basis. Let me highlight the reality that employers um, live in and what employers in Africa tell us. And what they tell us is that they have continued workers and skills shortage in many of the African countries. There's a global uh, study which highlights that uh, there's an average of 75% of employers, again, this is global, uh, which report difficulties in filling roles. They cannot find the skills they need. It's a global average, but it applies also uh, to the African continent. And interestingly, when the survey started, it's a yearly survey, and it started 10 years ago, the percentage at that time was around 35. We're now at 75%. And this trend is just moving up and is certainly not going to stop, uh, especially now as we transition to low carbon economies and we're going to need new skills uh, um, with, the, with the ambition of um, meeting the net zero emissions by 2050, which uh, can create, really estimates say, can create 30 million jobs globally by 2030. So this transition will create new jobs. The employers will need new skills. Uh, and this applies um, on to employers in the African continent as well. So there's this skills shortage. And uh, it's also combined with a skills mismatch. And that's what you were uh, saying, Albert, that there's in many countries, employers report that the skills that come out of school do not align with uh, labor market needs. What we see is that there is a surplus of university graduates, but a shortage of trade workers in very specific sectors, such as manufacturing, for example. And um, this uh, is the case in many African countries where uh, employers report that the education systems are not aligned with labor market needs. So there are many solutions to address this skills shortage and this um, skills mismatch, uh, including, you know, upskilling, training, retraining, labor market integration, but also skills mobility. And here we may talk about south-south uh, mobility, right? We may also look at uh, uh, look at how within the African continent, free movement could be improved. I'm not saying that migration and the mobility of people will fix <laughs> the skills shortage, but it's part of the, of the solutions. And when we look at the skills mobility partnerships, which include both a skilling and a migration component, that can be a, a solution which really leads to greater returns and um, economic developments for all the countries involved. So from, you know, from the point of view of employers, there's a skill shortage in many uh, sectors, difficulty in finding qualified labor. So uh, we really try to find skills in neighboring countries and beyond, uh, but it's difficult to attract the talent because the legal channels for migration needs to be 
improved. What what our Moroccan um, member employer federation like to say, and I, I like to quote him, it's that for employer skills have no nationality. Um, the employers, when they try to hire, they don't look at um, where the person comes from. They look at um, what the skills that person can bring to the company. Now, if it becomes too cumbersome to bring that skill, uh, that person from wherever it's based, then the employer may just, you know, look at another option. If the paperwork and the, um, uh, the you know, the administrative procedures are cost too costly, too long, uh, you know, we need a month to get a work permit, then they will need to find other ways. Sometimes there are no other ways, so employers go through those I mean, procedures. Uh, but that's where, again, the skills mobility partnerships can help because we assume that it would facilitate uh, this mobility and this, um, uh, this hiring process. Now, what we have done um, on the skills mobility partnership very uh, precisely, uh, and, and you were asking me what IOE has been doing in this field, we've worked together with um, the OECD um, uh, end of last year. Uh, we had two webinars uh, where we had more than 250 employers participating globally again. And we launched a paper that was presented at the last summit of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. And what did the employers tell us in that, um, in that regard? That the skills mobility partnerships and the labor migration channels need to be adapted to the unmet demand for skills. Um, it's generally hard to find uh, suitable channels for international recruitment of trades and technical workers, for example, where the demand is often really the highest. Uh, we have a very specific example, which is the road uh, transport sector, uh, which needs to fill hundreds of thousands of positions uh, in Europe alone. Uh, and I don't think that the world is, is short of, of drivers, right? So there, there are really unmet demands that this skills mobility partnership should be responding to. The, the second point is about the training quality. Um, the the employers were telling us that they need some reassurances about training quality and suitability. Uh, Mr. Gruber was saying that the training needs to be done according to the needs of the countries of destination or of the employers in the countries of destination, I would say. Um, and, and the employers were saying that they are willing to wait longer and pay more by investing in preparation to get the candidate they need. So they would support training, but really if it's done by someone they trust, um, because employers prefer to recruit from countries of origin with which they have experienced um, they have experience and knowledge of training standards. So that's where high-level bilateral state-to-state -state relationships may not always reflect uh, employers' priority in terms of proximity of training and experience with the recruitment. And the third point on, on skills mobility partnership, which is key for employers, is really the predictability and the speed. Um, you know, transparent, fast-track relationships, um, fast-track uh, treatment, uh, would certainly make this skills mobility partnership more attractive. Um, but now it's really hard to find examples where, you know, the, the, the speed of the process um, helps. And I would agree with Mr. Gruber, uh, we don't need to go too fast. We need to build trust. And trust is a key word. As long as we have this trust uh, built, we trust the education system, we trust that we can... Um, use the legal channels in a way that we can attract the people we need uh, will then help us um, scale some of the um, of the uh, pilots that we're uh, that are now tested um, so one of the one of the limits that we see from the current pilots it's that they're driven by development cooperation priorities and they often focus on countries from which employers had never recruited or which they have not chosen. And this makes it difficult then for employers to really be um, fully engaged. So this is, um, th there's a strong interest uh, from employers to, to participate in those skills mobility partnership. But again, um, we need to, to include, uh, they, they need to be included as much as, as possible so that um, 
the, the solution is really a, a, a win for all. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, for that uh, in, insight from the employer's perspective, because I think it's very, very critical if we are advocating for demand-led uh, migration, especially in this context, skills labor migration, which is demand-led, then then what you are saying is is exactly what we need to hear. And, and I hope that our constituents who are participating in this webinar are taking note of some of these findings that IOE uh, has, has, has now documented in this particular report, uh, for the issue of trust, uh, the issue of training quality, they want to trust the system, they want institutions that they can trust, um, and the productivity, the speed at which all these things, and I'm very happy to say that generally they are willing to invest time and resources, but they want to be assured that they will get the, uh, the product that they're looking for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I believe our participants are taking note and they will have a lot of questions uh, to you. So let's move on to uh, Dr. Sina, uh, whom I had, uh, uh, described as uh, an expert uh, in labor migration. I, I personally have I've read and I've seen some of uh, uh, his work uh, around um, uh, skills, uh, skill-based labor migration and, uh, and the concept as to whether it leads to brain drain. Uh, Dr. Sina, I would like you to take our audience into the, the what are the emerging trends and dynamics of um, skilled labor migration within the continent itself, but also beyond where, you know, there are some complaints that um, uh, skilled workers from Africa are actually leaving the continent and therefore uh, depleting the continent of the much needed human resource. Uh, but then what is your perspective and what are the trends showing in terms of skills labor migration within the continent itself uh, uh, and how are the dynamics playing around, especially after listening to the perspective from the employers, but also uh, from Germany. Welcome, Dr. Sina. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, can I uh, put up a short presentation? Yes, please. Uh, I have some yes. uh, data and some, some charts. I thought I will share with all the participants in this webinar. Yes, uh, please. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, Honore, uh, 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 Dr. Sina has access to share his presentation as well. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, so let me just expand it and then... Okay, wonderful. Uh, okay, no, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, I think the topic of this webinar is very relevant uh, uh, to the work that we are doing within the social policy section and within ECA. And I'm going to share some uh, key messages of a report that we have worked on and which has direct relevance to the topic of the webinar. So let me get started. Um, here, what, what exactly we are looking at? We are at the uh, in con confluence of three broad trends we are looking at. So while this is what the earlier speakers, both uh, Mr. Gruber and Stephanie did talk about, was the um, the skills and the need and how the skills uh, migration can be um, regularized in a way we are looking at it not just as skills migration but linking it up with africa's demographic transition and this whole uh, skills youth skills and employment issue which is the most serious issue in africa so this is what the report tries to do and uh, let me just quickly go through it um, so, so this is the background. So, I mean, so Africa's population is, uh, by the latest reports, has actually crossed 1.5 billion, and is projected to reach almost 2.5 billion by 2050. And as you can see from the left hand Sorry. side, your slide is not moving. So, if you are moving, uh, we are not seeing the movement. Oh, yes. How do I? How do I make sure <laughs> that it moves? Uh, can you see this one? Me. Can you see the center pillars, central pillars? What are you seeing? I, I only see the first page, the, the title page. Oh, I yes. have moved. So then what do we do? Then how do I move? <laughs> I was I thought I was pressing the right buttons. Uh, I don't know. Um, um I think I think you will have to go into presenter mode or you'll have to manually select the slides that you want to be presenting on the screen. 
So I hang on. Put it in the presenter mode, maybe, and then or or much well. How do I get into the presenter mode? There's a taskbar. There's a display of settings. Yeah. So then. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I go to the soft presenter and slideshow. Yes, if you can click those arrows, can you try to click them forward? No, I know, but uh, there are two options. The uh, either I swap presenter view and slideshow, or duplicate the slideshow. I guess duplicate. Can you see something now? Yes, we can see. Yeah, oh, and it's, okay. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, and uh, please you use move. use ten minutes because use ten minutes because we need to give participants some some time also to ask you questions. Uh, I'll be as quick as possible once okay, I get thank started. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so can you see the second slide now? Yes. Yes, we can now okay, see. Okay, wonderful. So, as I was saying, the the report that I'm basing this presentation is on is really looking at it in a larger perspective, not just as um, uh, regular migration uh, from Africa to Europe and North America. Now, what 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 the what are the data? What are the data telling us? Uh, is this uh, Africa's share of the global population has really uh, is is gone up from ten percent in 1960 to it's about eighteen percent by 2050. Uh, one in uh, four um, people in uh, globally will be from Africa. Okay, and uh, because Africa's population, by the latest report from the World Population Prospects. Uh, indicates that it has crossed 1.5 billion and it's going to reach about 2.5 billion by 2050. Then on the right hand side, you see that the, the trajectory is such that Africa's population will continue to increase and grow till the end of the century, even while in the other regions it will be declining. So you can see the trend and the broad uh, red, red line is the one which is about Africa. Now, the whole issue, the discussion we are talking about is linked to Africa's demographic opportunity in the demographic window, because we cannot talk about employment uh, without uh, talking about the demographic uh, opportunity in the window, and uh, the dividend, uh, because of the rising share of the working age population. By the analysis from the data available, uh, and if you look at the uh, this row, which this 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 arrow, which talks about Africa, uh, and the trajectory. And basically we are plotting the proportion of working age population to dependent population over the years. And from the other continents, other regions you see, they have high, they have peaked earlier. You, you see these various peaks in Europe, in North America, in Latin America, Asia, they have peaked. And Africa is now growing. The proportion of working age population is growing. It's going to, we are at the cross stage 2024. The red dot is something very significant, which I'm going to talk about briefly. And this is a trajectory which, which will carry on for Africa over the next uh, decades in the, in, the, in the 21st century. Now, what it implies and what it indicates is something very important for us. And this is something that I wanted to uh, highlight here, is that firstly, uh, the arrow indicates that we have a 20 year period between now and 2044, when the benefits of a demographic dividend can start kicking in. So the window is open, the demographic window has been open since 1980, 1990, and 1990, but only when it crosses the certain threshold of about 1.7 workers to dependents, 1.7 is to one ratio of workers to dependents, that is the when, that is the time when uh, the dividend can begin to um, uh, come in. Now that is going to happen by the current projections in 2044. So it's really precisely 20 years for Africa to prepare itself to be able to reap that dividend. So that is the first point that we wanted to uh, highlight. So in terms of what the national policies, strategies need to be, what the international donors need to help out and support the countries in Africa is this 20 year period between now and 2044. Because then it uh, the 1.7 is to one is that um, ratio of workers to dependents, which is when um, things begin to happen. But then the workers need to be uh, qualified. They need to have the skills. They need to have all the other things in place for them to uh, start benefiting the economy. Now that period is going to go on till the end of the century because it is going to stay above 1.7 uh, is to one. 
And very interestingly, this is the time when Africa will be peaking when other continents are declining. So in a sense, there will be a complementarity. And this is where this whole issue of international migration comes in. And this whole question of managing the labor force, international labor force comes in. So because if the jobs are going to be in Europe and North America and the labor force is going to be, and the working age population is going to be in, in Africa, then I think there is a mismatch and there has to be some convergence for things to move together. So I think that is very interesting. So in all the major continents, the, the proportion of working age population is on a decline at the time at which Africa is going to be on the ascendancy. So that is the other key point that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the, other, the other thing is related to Af Africa's fertil fertility history is because is the, that the growth is very gradual. Unlike other countries where, which were able to reduce the fertility very sharply. And so you see Asia really climbing up in terms of proportion of working age population to dependents. Uh, Latin America climbing up, North America, really increasing the um, uh, maximum that they could get. And Africa's uh, incline is more gradual. That is because of the fertility drag. They have uh, very high fertilities. The average is down to 3.8, but 3.8 is still very high. Uh, 3.8 births to a woman uh, is still very high, but it is still down from 5.9 or something. So in that sense, um, uh, um, African women are producing two, two children less in 2024 than they did in 1990. So there has been a fertility decline, but it's from a very high level and it is very gradual. So as a result, the um, uh, the increase of working age population is going to be very gradual. And so that is something that needs to be kept in mind as well. But the point really we are trying to make is that this is the time when there will be a complementarity between African labor, labor, labor force and the uh, labor force in the rest of the continents. And so therefore, there is an opportunity for, for African labor force to be able to fill uh, those uh, um, uh, vacancy, vacant positions, the requirements. And this is where we need to uh, work together to see how best that can be done. These are the key conclusions I talked about. And the main point really for the African governments is that a demographic dividend is neither automatic nor guaranteed. Just because you're going to have the numbers of people doesn't mean you're going to get the dividend. They have to be uh, in a position to be able to benefit from it, which means they should have the necessary skills to be able to uh, benefit from the opportunities that may arise. <laughs> and therefore, investments in the next 20 years are critical as to whether and to what extent Africa can reap the demographic dividend. But what is the current trend? So apart from the population distribution that I've spoken about, the proportion of people, we have got 57% in the productive age group, and by 2050, nearly 63% of the population will be in a productive age group. So we are talking about very large numbers. So while there is a potential, but if you look at the education sector, uh, while the primary enrollment rates have really gone up, the secondary enrollment rates, which really forms the base of the labor market, is still very low at 44%. At tertiary levels, the enrollments are less than 10%. And whosoever is entering the lab domestic labor market, they are not entering with any uh, industry relevant skills. And that, that is something which is important that we need to keep in mind. I'm sorry, I keep moving this. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is something that has also been mentioned that nearly 22% of businesses have reported um, a lack of skills as a major constraint. So even very few people uh, are enrolled of those who are enrolled who have an in, at least intermediate education, it's not of the correct skills variety. So there is a mismatch uh, both within the continent and of course in the external um, labor market as well. And at the same time, I talked about the fertility, I talked about the population increase. So the population is growing faster, the youth population is growing much faster than the jobs that are being created. So by our analysis by 22, between the period 22 and 2050, in the next 25 years, um, there'll only be about 150 million new jobs, but there were, might be 600 million people who will be seeking them. So there is a mismatch there. Now the mismatch is both on the demand side and as well as on the supply side, because the supply side is not producing uh, the workers of the necessary skills. 
And so therefore, that is one of the reasons why we find such high levels of informal employment for the youth who are into with low productivity and low wages. <coughs> Excuse me. And now this is the skills mismatch I wanted to talk about, about which affects productivity and value addition. Um, um, because the uh, education system uh, doesn't uh, really provide and create that kind of a, um, um, uh, um, skills, uh, skill uh, young people to enter the labor market. Because there's been a very weak emphasis on STEM subjects, so the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, which has affected Africa's capacity for research and innovation. And STEM research constitutes less than 30% of Africa's total research output. When we talk about TIVET, it contributes skill, skilling youth to, for employability, but African countries are not invested enough on TIVET at scale. And so creating a skilled workforce, which is the central um, block for the whole discussion that we have on uh, uh, labor uh, market and employment, um, it requires improvement in both access to and quality of basic education. And here, here, education and skill development is severely constrained by funding. And this is very important that uh, nearly half the countries in Africa allocate less than 20% of national budget to education sector. And if you look at this fact uh, alongside the huge debt distress that the countries are facing, more money, more allocation of resources is going to be extremely difficult uh, for uh, these uh, secondary school or the uh, higher education. And so therefore, where are the skills going to come from? Who's going to invest in these skills for these countries? And this is just something the same, the proportion. And this is the uh, other thing I wanted to compare with between Africa and Europe. At, at, at the current stage, we have about 38% um, um, uh, in the 18% um, and 38% in the uh, working age population, which is going to increase, as I mentioned, the yellow and the greens on the left-hand side. But in Europe, it is going to shrink. So there is a complementarity here, uh, uh, So which, which could be an opportunity for Africa if it has, if it is in the correct position to, able, to be able to benefit from it. So as you can see from the green on the right-hand side from Europe, it is going to decline from 54% to 47%, and the uh, youth are from 10% to 9%. So this decline in Europe is at the same time, going at the same time with the increase in Africa. So the numbers are going to increase in Africa, in Europe are going to decline. Now, to whether and to what extent can this labor market, this, this labor um, be, uh, the shortage in Europe be compensated by the labor in Africa, which is what migration is all about, uh, or most of it, uh, I think is is an important analytical question here. Now, what are the migration trends? Now, this is very interesting. We looked at some data with coming out databases we have looked at. So there are a large number of uh, people who both skilled and unskilled and semi-skilled who are migrating to other countries. So if the skills uh, are migrating, uh, are moving out, uh, this is this is a misallocation of resources, and this is a very crucial part uh, for uh, the development policy for each of the countries. Now, migration flows from Africa to Europe and North America are increasing, and tertiary educated workers account for more than 40% 40, 40 of total migrants from the continent. Uh, there are data constraints. Uh, it's not nothing. It's, it's it's a very it's very tricky to get exact data on migration. But about fifty three percent of African migrants migrate within the continent, which is what the stylized fact we know that most of the migrants, uh, African migrants, migrate within the continent. But less so. It is not very high as seventy or eighty percent. It's just about fifty three percent who who migrate within the continent, and the large number of proportion of African migrants are moving out. But if we break up the data, and the data here is helpful in breaking it up between tertiary and non-tertiary educated migrants, uh, we find that 88% of all Africans migrate within Africa with non-tertiary education, which is understandable. 78% of my Africans migrating to Europe are also with non-tertiary education, and similarly to the Gulf um, states. But interestingly, the last bullet is very interesting, is 63% of all Africans migrating to North America are with tertiary education. So there is a clear distinction happening between um, North America and rest of the world in terms of uh, very attraction for 
uh, skills. Where are the skills going? Okay. This is something the same thing in, in, in a tabular form. Uh, so if you look at the left hand left hand panel is the Africa in 2026% were migrating to Africa within Africa that stays between 21 29 percent till 2020 2020 within Africa in Europe is 41 39 27 percent of tertiary educated migrants but interestingly in North America the ratio has increased and that is the state of the tertiary educated migrants. Now we come to the right hand panel on the non tertiary. And understandably, the majority, 60%, 62, 57, 60% of migrants from Africa uh, within Africa are non tertiary. So, kind of semi skilled or unskilled, they are all in that category. And for North America and Europe, Europe is still very high non tertiary, but very few non tertiary migrants move to America. That is very clear, the, 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 the middle red line. And the data sources we have indicated below are from the World Bank uh, Global Migration Database that we have collected and we have analyzed for this purpose. So you can see the distinction and where the skills are moving is, is something very interesting. Uh, this is also something is similar, but it just depicts it differently. Again, the same thing, but slightly depicting differently. So it's the blue part is within my, within Africa. So tertiary educated migrants on the left hand side moving within Africa, 26, 21, 20, 29 percent. More tertiary educated migrants now moving within Africa, let's say from Ghana to Nigeria or something like that, or from uh, Zimbabwe to Ghana. So those kind of migrations are taking place. Uh, Europe is becoming less important for tertiary educated migrants, which is in the orange. And in America, it has really increased. It is high, 28 percent. It's, it's a very high uh, proportion of tertiary migrants moving there. And uh, on the right hand side is a non tertiary. The blue is a predominant, as I said, it's about the uh, non tertiary migrants, African migrants moving within Africa. So, what are the policy implications? Now, this is very important. And the loss of skills is worrisome of, uh, for countries in Africa that already suffer from low human capital. And this is what we have talked about. This is what we know. This is the thing. So the migration, the moving of skills is one on the one hand is, is, is an important element of development policy. But let's not lose fact, lose sight of the fact that it, 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 it indicates a loss of skills for countries that already have limited skills. Now, why it is such an important issue is because tertiary and professional education are financed from severely limited public funds, uh, public education budgets. So in effect, poorer African countries are implicitly subsidizing richer countries through migration of their skilled labor. And that is where um, some kind of an arrangement, global skills partnership that was mentioned by the two previous speakers and which is being much talked about could be an important um, opportunity for uh, regular pathways uh, for 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 migration to take place in a way that is beneficial uh, in a uh, for for everyone, and I think that is important to create avenues for regular pathways to reduce the pressure on irregular migration, which is through touts, which is through all irregular means, which is not uh, I think which which very often takes place in a situation where there are very few regular pathways, and so it's important to keep that in sight as well. And that is a very important element of the global compact on migration that we are talking about. Uh, lastly, uh, this is something which is interesting. This is what we are linking up, that the national employment policies should be linked with the migration, with the skills migration. So that is something which is very important. Uh, the two need to be looked at together. And policymakers, while devising policies for jobs, to increasing jobs for youth within national boundaries, and this is what we talk about jobs in Africa, they need to also identify opportunities and partner with countries in the region or outside to absorb their increasing and young labor force. So the jobs in Africa or jobs for Africans. I think the two things are related and the two things are very important. So let's not just focus on one or the other. And I think the two need to go together and that's very important. And the skills migration need to become a key element of national employment policies. In some countries it is, but not in all. And I think that is very important because very often the two are under different ministries. They work in silos. They don't always talk to each other. And that's there. I'm sorry, the last two bullets were not included properly, but I think uh, mobility of skilled my, uh, my labor from Africa is a very important issue. And I think we need to have these kind of discussions at different levels. 
and global skills partnership between source and destination countries should be maximized. So this is something that we have been discussing, and this is also the topic for this discussion of the webinar, uh, except that I think uh, here, I think um, what we are going out on a limb in the report, we are also uh, suggesting and strongly recommending that they should be, maybe let's say the uh, countries of destination uh, should be putting money where their mouth is, so to say, in the sense, what if the countries of destination fund the countries of origin to uh, attract that much of uh, skilled labor, which the money that can be used then to fund and to uh, increase the skill levels within the countries of origin. So there has to be some kind of a skills partnership, which includes a financial arrangement where the country, where these country of destination has an arrangement with the country of origin for, let's say I need hundred doctors or maybe a thousand doctors every year. And this is the money we are providing you because training a doctor, and this is the analysis we are doing in the report, the training the doctors, for example, just to use the medical example, uh, is much more expensive in Europe and elsewhere than, and if the same quality standards or similar quality, quality standards could be developed, for example, in Ghana or Nigeria or Zimbabwe, uh, those doctors could be developed at a much cheaper price. So it's advantages to the country of destination. And then when that skills are available, you, you take the, the country of origin can pick out 100 or 200 of those doctors. The remaining who remain in the country would have a higher level of skills that they currently have. So not only will the skills level improve, but the numbers will also increase. And so in that sense, if you look at the numbers, the numbers are also very low. So in that sense, that could be a kind of a triangular arrangement between the uh, countries of origin, the destination, uh, the the migrant and the skilled migrant and the private sector because the many times the absorbing uh, sort of agency would be the private sector so there could be a kind of a four way arrangement something which is very important uh, which could really be the most sustainable solution thank you thank you very much thank you so much dr sina for uh, that um, uh, analysis and and i really wanted uh, this analysis to come uh to the audience so that they can also see the, the, the dynamics of um, uh, uh, skills development in Africa, the labor migration, and, and some of the issues that you've raised really uh, are linked to what uh, Stephanie and also uh, uh, John indicated in, in, in their presentation, particularly you are con concluding a slide on um, the need for us to uh, you know uh, work on a, a partnerships a certain kind of arrangement that can benefit also both uh, destination and, and and origin countries i like the message that uh, yes we pride ourselves as africa at having um, uh, the people the workers uh, uh, but if we are not careful if we don't invest in the quality of training if we don't make sure that people get the right skills that are addressing the demand of the opportunities that are emerging uh, either within the continent or beyond, then we are not going to get the dividend. And I think that is a key policy message for um, our constituents. I know we've uh, gone overboard in terms of time, but I just wanted to give time to participants, to any of our participants who want to ask um, a question uh, or even reflect or comment on um, any of the issues that our panelists have raised. Uh, and then we'll have um, a, a sum up by the by the by the panelists. So if if you are you have a question, I see Sam Samuel Ami. Can you please take the podium, Samuel? Samuel Ami, I saw your hands. Uh, are you able to 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 speak? Okay, I, I think, uh, okay, then uh, Desta, Desta, please, while we wait for Samuel, Desta, can you please uh, intervene? You are muted. You have muted your mic, Desta. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I am a PhD student at uh, here in Ethiopia at the University of Gunda. Uh, and also my PhD in title was the Return Migrant Entrepreneurship. Uh, but most of the researchers uh, suggest that entrepreneurship like training, skill, and financial support as use a mitigation strategy for the return migrant uh, return to the origin of their countries. My question suggests that 
what kinds of actionable uh, steps or strategies that can be implemented in entrepreneurship, skill and training in general, and the financial support in particular for return migrants of their origin of their country, because the return have, as we know, that are acquired skill and knowledge and in abroad. But we need to utilize whether in Africa or here in particular in Ethiopia, one of the most uh, contributors or consider as a change agent of like return. Thank you very much. So thank you. Let's let's take a few more questions um, or reflections or comments from the panelists. Any any other question? Any other comment from the panelists? I mean from the uh, from the audience. Albert, if I may, um, I, yes, I believe please. that I believe yeah. they are writing it on the um, question and answer. Perhaps we can read it to the uh, panelists, if right. Okay. Help me with, can you help me with that, uh, Jonas? Uh, I don't seem to to see them. Sure, sure, absolutely. So I think there is this first question by Combo. It's in in French, I presume. So perhaps just to translate that. Um, so he say he says how migratory flows can accelerate the implementation of the African continental free trade area, and then he asked also is that with the wave of anti-immigration demonstrations in England and with the rise of anti-immigration political parties in Germany, France, and Italy is isn't part of Europe closing its on its uh, does immigration still have its place in Europe. Uh, this question is, of course, addressed to the pan, the first panelist. I presume to to John. So, um, yeah, that was the first question, and then perhaps we can, in the interest of time, we can see the the rest. Over. That we can see because we now have only two. Okay. Okay, I think um, the, the first question was on uh, entrepreneurship uh, um, uh, training for return migrant workers. This uh, this is a question I think that uh, ILO Kidest, are you online still? Can you can you answer that? Okay. Um, any panelists who want to um, answer that the sentiment from uh, our participant? Uh, but I think it's more focused on return migrant workers, and I think it's linked to uh, one of the recommendations that uh, Dr. Sina had indicated that at least member states or countries can try to create jobs within uh, their boundaries. Yet, yes, uh, uh, yet, Gruba, uh, Mr. Gruba, if you can. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few words because I think the other questions are also uh, very. Yeah, yes, 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 Here, yes. Um, uh, This is the starting point where, uh, in a way, also the, if you want to develop and make those migration started. Uh, so, sorry, Mr. Gruba, I think there's some echo. There's some noise from your end. I don't know what it is. Some echo. No better? Yeah, now it's better. Yeah. Oh, sorry for that. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I think that's the starting point where I think the nexus between development and migration started. No, how to engage the diaspora, how remittances can be in a way uh, useful for context. And on the other hand, how return migration uh, could be in a way mobilized um, uh, or activated coming back. And I think um, we with GIZ programs financed by the ministry, we, we invested a lot also in these centers of migration, working hand in hand with the ecosystem on the ground, how we can give information, this 360 degree approach that you give information outward migration and inward migration. I think these are um, still, I think, topics where the relevant ecosystem in my point of view, has to be connected. That you have, that you understand. What can I do with this exam, with these experiences? Where are investments? Um, when I bring in some money, where is the connecting partner? This business to business topics, and and I, I think at best, if we develop the migration partnerships and if you want the skills partnerships in a good way, then I think we even have this ecosystem built up in the next twenty years. If I take the window of uh, of Dr. Uh, 
um, um, soon up um, because I think that's really the key here um, and I think there are different measures uh, which could come of course and I think uh, in, in, in Ethiopia there are also uh, many many activities under token uh, undertaken to to develop an infrastructure for newcomers newcomers returnees exactly because of course they lose some connection and having family but perhaps not sector relevant contacts and I think that's key <clears throat> Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Gruber. But can you also reflect on the anti-migration wave and 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 of how course. does that play into this? <laughs> of course, of course. This is of course somebody for somebody who is working in the migration field. Uh, a heavy topic um, because on the one hand you see here the economy we have also elections in different state levels if you take Germany as the example where the economy is really really clearly um, exposing we need um, inward migration we need diversity and that's key for the overall future of germany on the one hand and on the other hand we have uh, that's a really complex mix of observations and experiences of course of humanitarian migration and of course um, in a way uh, shrinking economy uh, and different different transformation um, topics we have uh, yeah, currently also uh, that, you know, that, Oh, there's somebody coming in even, but you can hear me. So, and that's why I think still, if you take the figures and the facts and also the mainstream policies we have, uh, the, this pathway is still on the agenda. But of course, we have a very strong discussion and the society really has to discuss and has to be clear what is the way forward. But um, it is still a clear pathway that the demographic change has to be managed and then migration, inward migration, is one of the key pillars of it. But of course, as you see, it's really not something what you can do by order. It's something what has to be into, involved into a democratic discussion and the public discussion and that the stakeholders really take um, the, their voice into one direction. Um, and I think that's where we are in. But uh, I can assume um, that uh, this topic is still high on the agenda on, on, on all levels. And of course, we have to have an eye on the environment. But this is really obvious. It's not something what we can, in a way, just tick the box. Uh, regarded uh, directed to IOE. Jonas, please. Oh. Okay, thank you, Albert. Just a quick one, actually, that I found here. Um, what is the role of qualifications framework in promoting skills mobility, and what should Africa be focusing on in this regard? It is from anonymous attendee. So perhaps for the IOE. Uh, uh, but uh, Stephanie, if you can, you can yeah. come in as well. Yeah, sure. Sure, absolutely. And maybe I'll pick up also on other questions and, and I, I wrap up because I'm aware we're a little bit um, short on time. Um, the qualification framework, that's uh, for us, it's key for qualification frameworks to be, to be uh, in place. Uh, skills recognition is the most complicated part, I think, when it comes to uh, those skills mobility partnerships. Um, we would need, you know, in this ideal world, we would need a harmonized global skills recognition framework that would allow um, skills to be uh, recognized in country A, skills acquired in country A to be recognized in country B as, as uh, in an easy way. But this is definitely not the case. And this is what also um, puts a barrier for employers to be able to hire. Uh, and very concretely, very technically, when uh, um, an employer uh, applies for a work permit for an employee, a potential employee, and uh, there's um, uh, this very specific work category that is uh, open for work permits, which requires this specific skills. Uh, if we cannot tick that box, we cannot get the work permit. Although we we went through interviews, we have identified this person as a good worker, as a good potential contributor to the company. The person has the skills that are needed, the human and social skills that are needed. But the this you know very technical um, qualification is missing or, or is not recognized in the country, and it 
just everything falls apart. So so qualification frameworks are are really key to be improved. Uh, maybe uh, I also wanted to uh, jump on the point on on the narrative um, and and respond to the point that migration has its place in Europe. It has its place in the Americas. It has its place in Africa. It has its place everywhere. Um, the it's not only in Europe that we have anti-immigration uh, discourse. It happens actually everywhere. It's a year this year with a lot of um, elections, as we know, and, and the, the candidates use uh, the anti-immigration arguments to get votes, as sad as it can be. So I think what we need all to do, and, and business has its role to play too, is really to uh, emphasize the positive economic impact of well-regulated well migration, to change this narrative to showcase that we need migration to happen. We need legal pathways to bring people where they're needed. And we need this to happen in a smooth manner for economies to strive, for societies to be able to, to live uh, in peace. So, so this anti-migration rhetoric happens everywhere, uh, in, every, you know, in many countries, and, and we all have a role to play to, to improve that. A point on employment in Africa, for us, this is a key, and the presentation for, from Dr. Sina was, was really important in this conversation, um, because for employers in Africa, again, um, what they, they want, don't want to see their people go, right? They want to, as much as possible, keep uh, trained and skilled people uh, in, in Africa, in their countries. If they want to leave because they want to you know, experience uh, something abroad, uh, I mean, everybody is uh, free to do that. But as much as possible, the employers in Africa are, are would rather have them uh, stay and contribute to their own economies. Is it about a lack of information uh, sharing because the young generation is not maybe not aware of the jobs that are available? Um, uh, so they turn into the informal uh, employment. And here, I think we really call on government to help transitioning transitioning from the informal to the formal economy so that the youth uh, the young generation can also enter the labor market in the in the formal way and when we talk also about um, employment in africa we also look at um and this was also a question in the chat uh, enabling environment for businesses to be created, to, be, to, to grow, for businesses to strive, to create productive employment. So we're really calling on governments to help businesses, to help um, uh, businesses to be set up, to open shop, to uh, remove the red tapes, to make it administratively easy to set up a business uh, and for government to really support and not put further barriers for companies to be able to, to open up where, where they're needed. Education is the pillar, and uh, we would also call for more investment in, in education. Education is, is key uh, for employment, of course, but also for uh, a young person to be able to make, um, to make informed decision about whether to stay or whether to leave or whether, you know, informed decision about life's choices. Africa Free Trade Agreement, um, we would, we're really looking into this instrument to enable uh, free movement of people as much as possible and free movement of workers um, uh, on top of that. Uh, and when Schengen area was created in Europe, it did alleviate skill shortages by helping uh, people to move more easily to get um, to get employment. So this is something we would be uh, really pushing for. Skills mobility partnerships, I just wanted to finish with this. Um, uh, four actions that we have put together in our paper that we presented that I just wanted to highlight here for skills mobility partnership to, to work. I think most importantly, and we spoke about this, they, they need to be demand driven. And when we speak about skills mobility partnership, it doesn't need to be from Europe to Africa. It can be from two African countries. It can be from Africa to another, you know, from an African country to another. So I, I don't want to focus this on Africa, Africa, Europe, but in any case, they need to be demand driven and, and see where the skills needs are. We need to engage businesses early in and throughout the design and implementation of these partnerships. The national employers organizations and the industry specific associations can really be helpful in identifying uh, partners um, that can help in the process. A third point really important is mapping existing training programs abroad 
according to the employer's needs. And I think we've referred to that as well. And finally, really ensuring a regular dialogue between the authorities and the employers and bringing all authorities at the table, the skills, um, the skills uh, um, departments, as well as the migration ministries. Uh, and, and I think Dr. Sina said that uh, they don't specifically talk to each other. So I think there needs to be some uh, organization that can bring them together uh, to ensure that the, the dialogue is, is there. Uh, and hopefully with this, we will have not a win-win situation, uh, Dr. Gruber, but a quadru quadruple, not a triple win, but a quadruple win situation for uh, every stakeholder, including employers in um, wherever they are, destination or countries of origin, to be able to, to strive as well. Thank you so much, Albert. I leave it here. Albert, you're muted. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, there are more questions. Um, I don't know if our French translators can help us, at least so that we give justice to the French asking colleagues. Uh, just oh. one or two questions from the question uh, panel so that I know we are behind time, but there seems to be more no. questions in French. No. Hello? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ami, someone. Yes, Can someone, please. Yes, please go oh, ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I stuck a <laughs> problem with a, an ICT. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Can you make your question quick? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I thank all the presenters and uh, for their nice presentation, but especially this one from Africa. Uh, highlights of dynamics in the labor migration. Thank you very much. I just, uh, got an insight on it. My first question to you is that uh, how Africa, you have said that uh, Africa's young people and uh, uh, working age is, is going, is, is, is increasing, is, is growing as compared to other Europe, other, other continents. Now, my question is, if that is the case and that is the opportunity as you have straight, you put it straight forward, how then Africa is prepared in terms of policies, strategic plan, and uh, a way forward to equip our people to harness such opportunities as you are coming from the policy uh, section or departments in Africa? That's my first question to, to this presentation. The second question to the other presentation, I think by Stephanie, is that, uh, uh, can you share with us how basically employers need to, to be taken on board uh, during the recruitment or fair recruitment and uh, during the uh, opinion collection in, in drafting uh, policy issues and policy uh, documents on labor migration particularly? And the, the last question is, on the leaflet experience in German, uh, can we can we get a leaflet on how the German uh, the diaspora are, are involved in the process of uh, skills development, which is demand driven, but uh, also in the engagement in the recruitment, fair recruitment uh, for the people who are going to work outside the country. And maybe to what extent uh, that uh, German has engaged uh, the diaspora uh, to get their opinions uh, because the diasporas are the partners in social economic development. Thank you. I think the questions were, were clear. Uh, so uh, uh, panelists who want to go first, I think one was on the policy framework. I don't know if it was a question or a reflection. Uh, Dr. Sina, you want to uh, quickly respond to that and then we'll come to uh, Mr. Gruber. Yes, uh, okay, no, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll respond very quickly to this. Uh, no, thank you for this question. I think it's important, but it is for each country to answer to themselves. They cannot be a common, uh, in that sense, a common policy. Uh, to be implemented. I think the main focus has to be on increasing the education levels. The secondary school enrollment rates are very low. 
there is a huge dropout after primary school. So the primary school completion rates have gone up, but the secondary school, which is the building block for any possible future employment for the youth, uh, is is still under underserved. And I think the emphasis should be on science and technology and the secondary school, which is very important. Uh, so the investment has to go in there. Uh, and I think that is something that uh, has to be uh, paid sufficient attention. I think that is that is extremely important. So as a short answer, that is what I can uh, provide you with. Thank you. You have any comments on Ami or, or some of the questions that were asked on the chat? I don't know if you are able to see them. Yeah, if thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Perhaps I try to make it short as well. Um, on the one hand, um, how to take the employers on board on, on, on projects. So of course, I think Stephanie can, uh, of course, uh, uh, develop some more ideas. But uh, in general, how, you, how we do it, for example, currently is that we involve um, them into working groups. That means um, we have, the, for example, an employer association who is part of the working group, but the employer association on the one hand from Germany and the employer association, for example, from Ghana or from Senegal. But this is, of course, um, um, the, the chance to involve different perspectives, but still we have to have a very pragmatic approach because if things getting too complex, it's really difficult. So I think we have to take the frameworks into account and having a clear working group with responsibility to, to drive things. But I think it's uh, very, very um, feasible to develop those uh, joint working groups. And this is, of course, also key that this has to continue this kind of exchange because no, you have to adapt according to the experiences because it's not not working by order. It's just by experience. And the second, of course, the leaflet concerning how the diaspora is involved. The diaspora in general is not the, the if you want, the demand side, but they are a mitigating, a, but a facilitating entity, which is always involved in the post, if you want, the post arrival situation. And there, if you take uh, programs like Triple Win, what we are conducting since about uh, 10, 11 years, there every country uh, context has a, an own diaspora WhatsApp group and receiving the candidates. And this is really the snowball system. But we do it also systematically that, that of course, they are part in... Um, uh, designing the procedure but of course this is um, as it is an informal way of organizing sometimes you have clubs who are involving and uh, who offer um, voluntary systems the question if you if you involve um, diaspora um, um, activities who pays the service if it's a professional one and if it's a more a kind of voluntary system then i think it's always easier of course that it's also coming from the own structures but i think it's key of course and of course what you what you mentioned as well the diaspora communication is key for the networks that somebody says hey this is a destination where all the transparent um, promises were taken serious and it's 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 uh, crucial that the good stories can follow these pathways and so that's why i think diaspora is there I, I can see what kind of documents we have there and share it with um, the organizers I think uh, uh, I, I had requested for the French yes. translators to read for us. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, please. Just, yes, just uh, so that uh, we give justice and then we will close. Absolutely. So um, just uh, on, the, on the three remaining questions, it's really around um, the free movement of people uh, and the, um, the linkage. Uh, he's generally asking why is there, if you could mention or articulate the linkage, between immigration and uh, the AFCFTA um, from um, um, yeah, the, the, the African Union's framework. Um, and uh, further to that, I think he also, he also anticipates that within the framework of the AFCFTA that there should be an explosion of internal migration in Africa. So I think he really just wants uh, a little bit of input or your thoughts on that aspect and uh, possibly also creating, I suppose, uh, an international day of uh, skills uh, for, for Africa on the 15th of July. 
Okay. Um, I think uh, we had we had hoped that we would have uh, an AU colleague here. Um, I, I, and I know, Stefania, you had uh, alluded to that in your response. Uh, but I think it, it is right that um, if we are talking about movement of goods, uh, then movement of people are um, is an integral part of that. And, and I think we need now to uh, also position uh, skills and mobility within the FTA discourse, which I believe is happening uh, uh, at some fora. And maybe we, we just need to find uh, the right people to talk about this. We had hoped that we would get some... Uh, colleagues from the AU uh, who could have also helped with the, with that uh, you know clarifications. Um, and unless unless uh, panelists want to uh, address any other issues, I would like to welcome. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Dr. Sina, please. You want to talk a little bit, and then no, after that, we'll, very quickly, very quickly yes, to, to respond on this free movement issue. Uh, so I'm not I'm not speaking on behalf of the AU. You see, uh, just my sense is that there is a lot of hesitancy in signing on to the free movement protocol, which, uh, if I remember correctly, only about four countries have signed on to the free movement protocol. And I think that is, a, I think, a kind of a stumbling block, though, because even though technically there might be an open, it might be an open and shut case that free movement of goods and services should be accompanied by free movement of people. But there is a lot of hesitancy uh, in signing a document uh, which which has the various stipulations and which even uh, indicates that the uh, people who move from other countries could not only get residency but could also set up businesses and enterprises. So there, it's a, it's a complicated uh, document, and I think um, uh, there there might be reasons why countries are hesitant in signing on to it though in principle they might be agreeing to it but i think there is there is some there are some issues there and it would be it would have been nice to have have the colleague from auc to clarify and provide more details on this but uh, that is something that is um, uh, not moving as fast as the afcfta recognition the afcfta uh, thing is because that has been really bought bought in by and by all the member states or by most of the member states and they have signed on to it and they've ratified it many of them i don't have the exact numbers but uh, the afcfta recognition validation acceptance buy-in uh, and ratification is much more advanced than on the free movement protocol and so i think that is something that needs to be looked at as to why and what is holding it back thank you so much dr sina and and we would like you to share with us the powerpoint uh, and also, um, uh, Stefania, the report, the IOA report, Listen, would be you. very, very useful yeah. uh, so okay, that we can also you. distribute amongst partners. Thank you. With that, let me invite Jonas uh, uh, to, uh, so that we can now conclude this one. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Albert. Um, I believe so. And then I, I have to say thank you as well. Uh, once again to our panelists and the, the, the contributors in general um, for making this webinar a success. Um, so perhaps before concluding, I think it would be ideal uh, the, um, to invite um, as the last result, of course, um, um, Ms. Sabine Kloss, the program manager and skills initiative for Africa. But before I do that, of course, uh, I'm sure that the panelists and the, the moderator uh, have made an incredible uh, discussion. So perhaps I have, I'm seeing more than 40 uh, plus participants. So can we have a round of applause, like even virtually for that matter? Yes, you can click that round of exactly. And then we're looking that. Thank you so very much. So I will go directly with uh, Ms. Sabine Kloss to, to give us a conclusion and a closure. Over to you. Ms. Sabine here, right? Yes, sorry. I was kicked out in the moment I was, I was a panelist. I'm so sorry. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now we can see you. <laughs> great. No, thank you very much. I think it was a very, very informative round. 
Um, I got a lot of insights and um, I think there's a lot of open questions um, I saw in the chat, but also the questions that we as a as stakeholders, I guess, have to um, find solutions for and um, yeah, also see what kind of projects are coming up in the next years or coming time. Um, yeah, I also would like as a project manager to refer to the Africa Skills Week in Ghana. I think there we will also have um, a lot of sessions looking into um, those kind of areas on migration, on skills, on um, also AFCFTA and um, the occupational, African occupational standard, as well as looking at um, the qualification standards. So um, we really hope also um, that with, with today, we could um, yeah, further go into our communications, go into um, also sharing some, some best practices. So I also thank again the, the panelists for, for being here, for giving their vast insight into the topic. Um, and yeah, um, as usual, also thank you so much, our partners, ILO, and the technical team um, behind the scenes. Um, thank you so much um, um, from my side and greetings from South Africa and over to you, Albert. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonas and... Uh... Uh, we should now close uh, and we'll break for lunch from our end. Absolutely. Have a good one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie uh, Gruber and, and Dr. Sina. Please share with us the documents and we'll also circulate uh, the recordings and um, a, a brief report and summary of our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you.